Great, thanks, Liz. And that's I think, a natural segue as we talk about the volume and uh, lit digital literacy of the communita communicators. Less could be more. Um, and a natural link into Imogen and talking about how this works actually in the field in terms of engaging with the people we're trying to help. Hi, yes. Um, that was an interesting way to put it because when I came in here, someone said, you, you can do the beneficiary communications bit. And apart from the fact that I totally wince at the word beneficiary, um, I think one of the most valuable things about this report, if we really take it seriously, is it does start to ask us, um, A, who's the beneficiary and who's the recipient these days, um, and B, question our basic assumption that our idea of communications in a disaster is us talking to people and people talking to us. Whereas if you look at what's actually going on and you take that statistic about 90% of lives being saved by people who are already there, then what this is actually about is how we help people talk to each other, or actually how we help the people who actually do that, which is the private sector. So it reframes our role in this space completely. Um, I think we also need to remember that the, uh, in that video you said you know, we have a unique opportunity. I mean, yeah, up to a point, but we've been having a unique opportunity for about 15 years now, not taking it. Um, if you want to see technology driving disaster response, um, then go hang out in Zatari camp or Darfur, where women were showing me how they were using phones to make decisions about whether or not they were going to go home in 2006. SMS has been around for 20 years. You know, this isn't new just because we've suddenly kind of decided it's new. Um, and the best innovation, the most interesting models, everything I've looked at personally and seen in the field that's interested me um, is coming from communities and civil society and the private sector uh, and diaspora groups, actually. It's coming from pretty much anywhere but us. Uh, I remember when I was working in Haiti, um, where the Red Cross had their first SMS blast system. And we got very excited because they suddenly realized they could use it for hurricane season to tell people um, where hurricanes were going to hit and to use it for early warning, uh, which was such a good idea. The phone company had been doing it for six years already in country, and none of us had noticed. Um, so again, uh, the other reason I think that we need to, we are the ones actually, in that video, again, we need to enable people. I think it's the other way around. I think we need to get people in the field to enable us to look at how, to understand how they work, how they use technology. Uh, not least because technology is not, it's the use of technology is what matters, not technology. Um, and it's a profoundly social and cultural activity. And I think that is one aspect of the digital divide, a concept with which I have some issues, um, that we don't go into enough. The digital divide is not just a question of access. The digital divide is a question of patterns of use um, that come from community and cultural relationships. So again, if you start talking about technology and divorce it from people, you're going to go very, very badly wrong. And that, I think, this report is very strong on. There's some piece of, Internews, I think, did a piece of research a couple of years ago which showed that 93% uh, of Ushahidi platforms established um, had had less than three entries because people thought if you applied the technology, then they would come, and it, it doesn't work like that. These are these are so, these are social and cultural communities generating this information. Um, the other thing I think is interesting about technology is <coughs> it can push people away. It can connect us, but it can push people away. As I mentioned earlier, I think in the Zatari camp right now, we have some of the most educated, technologically <coughs> savvy refugees as a profile we've ever had to deal with. But if you read the most recent UNHCR evaluation of the need to interact with them, and there is a great need to interact with them because we're still not doing the basics, never mind the, the, tele the, the technological stuff. Um, what they're stressing is the importance of face-to-face -face conversations because that is how you build trust and that is how you build relationships. And technology will never take that space from, um, from uh, the, the importance of, of personal interaction. Um, so yeah, ultimately, who's a beneficiary, who's a responder? If this is empowering responders, and they've done most of it themselves, figuring out how technology empowers them as local communities. Um, if uh, technology is also bringing other new groups, and the group I think who are most under-reflected in this report is the diaspora, um, particularly when you look at research earlier this year, which showed that in every single country in Africa, remittances outstrip official assistance 
sometimes by three to four times. So if you're actually looking at what is enabling people to survive in crisis situations, whether it's Zimbabwe or whether it's, it's Sudan, it's actually money coming from overseas, and that is technology is doing a huge amount to, um, to empower that and to bring diasporas into responses as meaningful, seriously influential group of people. Um, so yeah, I, I basically don't think it's about us. I think we're still framing a lot of this debate as being about what can we do? Um, and I'm not sure it's the right question. Good, and you used a really <coughs> interesting phrase when we were talking earlier about information ecology and the whole range of ways in which information is, is reaching people, which I thought was very, very powerful as well.